Hello everybody, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Izzy if you don't know me and today I'm going to be talking about the unsolved case of Margaret Ellen Fox. This case is so sad but still so relevant in today's day because what happened to Margaret could still happen to someone today. Anyways, without further ado, let's just get straight into it. 14-year-old Margaret Ellen Fox was a happy, caring, smart young girl. She was born on February 4th, 1960 to parents David and Mary Fox and had a really good upbringing. Her house in Burlington, New Jersey wasn't just a house, but a home. And this was because of the tight knit, close relationship that she had with her parents and her four brothers. Her upbringing up to this point had been very happy and nurturing, and it was basically the type of childhood that many people don't get to experience and dream about. Since Margaret had quite a few brothers, she knew how to hold her own. She wasn't afraid to fight back or talk back if they were play fighting or something like that. And she was really confident and just a bright person. She was taking piano lessons and she also really enjoyed riding horses and Margaret was very driven in all aspects of her life. At age 14, it was 1974 and Margaret had just graduated eighth grade and didn't just want to sit around all summer and do nothing. She wanted to be productive and start making some money. Shortly after summer break had started, Margaret was hanging out with her cousin Lynn and together they got the idea that they wanted to start babysitting. Lynn was pretty excited about the possibility of getting a summer job and for Margaret the babysitting came as a second nature to her. It was a really natural and realistic job idea because she had grown up with siblings her whole life and was a really nurturing and caring person. She had babysat her brothers or other family friends her whole life so she already had experience doing this kind of thing. Margaret approached her parents with this idea and at first they were apprehensive because they were very protective of Margaret and her brothers and this meant that she would be going to a stranger's house most likely because she was wanting to put an ad in the paper because that's what you did in the 1970s. You didn't have the internet to scour and look for jobs. You had to either post an ad in the newspaper saying that you could do a job or you posted an ad in the newspaper saying that you were looking for someone to do a certain job. Margaret was only 14 and if her parents agreed to this, she would be staying in an unfamiliar house, babysitting a kid she didn't really know, for random adults. Margaret wouldn't give up though. She wanted some spending money and she felt ready to take the next step into maturing and getting older, which was getting a job. After some persuasion, her parents finally gave in and on June 24th, 1974, Margaret and her cousin placed an ad in the newspaper. Over the weeks, Margaret and her cousin got a few inquiries, but it was nothing that they really pursued or took seriously up until June 19th when she received a call from a man who called himself John Marshall. John had actually first called Margaret's cousin Lynn, but when he found out that she was only 11, he said that she was too young and Lynn's mother also said, no, I don't want you doing this job because it was too far away from Lynn's house and she was only 11. Her mom didn't want her to travel so far. While on the phone with Margaret, John tells her that he's looking for a sitter to babysit his five-year-old son from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. every day during the week. He tells Margaret that he lives in Mount Holly, which is about seven miles away from where Margaret lived in Burlington, New Jersey. And on top of the $40 that he offered to pay Margaret per week, he offered to pay for her bus fare every day. Him or his wife will meet her at the station on High and Mill Street and then drive her to their house. And then at the end of the day, they will drive her back home. To Margaret, this deal seemed like everything she could want and more. John also told her that his house has a pool and a swing set that she can use with his son, so she was looking forward to having some fun for herself while making money. I can just imagine Margaret, she was probably so excited and hopeful that a job was coming to fruition and it seemed so great. She desperately wanted to do it. 
She came up to her parents later that night to tell them and ask if she could do it and she was super excited and they were happy for her but they were also still worried and a little uncomfortable with the whole idea of her going to a stranger's house. Her parents didn't even know this John guy or his family but the very next day their worries were set more at ease when they got to talk to John on the phone. The first time that he had called Margaret on the phone asking her if she would be interested in a job like this he said that she could start that Friday but the second time he called her he called to say that he had a death in the family, his mother-in-law had died, and he would have to postpone her babysitting till the 24th, which was that upcoming Monday. He also made plans that him or his wife would pick her up at the corner of the bus station in a red Volkswagen Bug. Margaret had been talking to him on her house phone because that's what they had at this time. They didn't have cell phones. So her parents were present when she was talking to him on the phone. So after he gave her all the details to solidify their plan of her coming to babysit, she handed the phone to her parents and they got to talk to John Marshall. Nothing seemed amiss or raised any red flags when they were talking to him on the phone. So after they got off the phone, they agreed to let Margaret babysit for this man and his family. And they kept telling themselves that they should be proud of how ambitious and driven Margaret was being. And her and her siblings were constantly nagging at them with how overprotective they were. And they wanted to show that they could loosen the reins and give her some freedom as she was growing up. Unfortunately, this babysitting job was too good to be true. And nowadays, we have to be so on guard with who we trust, what we do, where we go. And stuff like this happens all the time, or maybe it's just we're so much more aware of it because of the news and the media. But in the 70s, stuff like this didn't happen often. And when it did, people never thought that it would happen to them or anyone that they knew. And they gave their kids more freedom. And it was more common to just, to just go to strangers' houses or put more trust in people. On Monday, June 24th, 1974, Margaret got up bright and early with the anticipation that she was starting her new babysitting job today. She put on her maroon jeans with a yellow patch above the knee, a blue floral top, checkered jacket, and her brown sandals. And she was also wearing a gold necklace and a gold bracelet. As Margaret got ready to leave, she had a quick conversation with her parents where they told her good luck and to call her when they got to the Marshall's house. She walked to the bus station with her younger brother, Joe, and she had her purse her bathing suit, and a Huckleberry Hound eyeglass case in hand. Her brother Joe watched her board the bus around 8.40 a.m., and this would be the last time that anyone in her family ever saw her. During the 20-minute ride, Margaret made some conversation with some fellow passengers, and another passenger remembers seeing her get off the bus at the stop that she was supposed to stop at, and the same passenger saw her talking to a young man who was driving a red sports car. Meanwhile, at Margaret's house, her parents were waiting anxiously for the phone call that she was supposed to make once she made it there safely. With the bus ride and the drive to the Marshall's house, she most likely would have made it there by 9.20, 9.30, but that time came and went and they didn't hear from Margaret. Her parents were antsy and a little bit uneasy, but they just figured that Margaret got so wrapped up in getting acclimated to the new house and probably playing with the little boy that it just completely slipped her mind to call them. This wasn't an immediate red flag for her parents because it's common to forget to call. And trust me, I've done it and I'm sure that most of us can say the same. They decided to just wait and hold off because in the note that she had left them, she had wrote how she would be home around 2.30 or 3.00. So they decided to just wait until the afternoon and figured that everything was okay. Late afternoon came and Margaret hadn't called and she still wasn't home. And her parents had decided that they had waited long enough and decided to take action. One source says that Margaret's parents called the number that she had also left on the note and that it rang and rang until finally it answered 
and it wasn't John Marshall, but a random woman at a pay phone outside of an A&P supermarket. John Marshall gave Margaret this number saying that it was his number. So to find out that it was a payphone must have been a shock and an instant feeling of dread. Again, this piece of information was only mentioned in one source, but either way, her parents did end up finding out that the number that John Marshall had given them was from a payphone. Realizing that it was from a payphone must have been heart stopping because now they realized they had no way to get in contact with their daughter. They didn't have the address of where she was and now the phone number was bogus. It didn't go directly to the Marshall home but to a payphone. All her parents knew at this point was that John or his wife were supposed to pick up Margaret on the corner of High and Mill Street from the bus stop and drive her to their house. And that was it. Her mother started going through the telephone book because at this point, that was how you got the number for everything. And she started calling all the John Marshalls in the Mount Holly area in their area but it all turned up with nothing helpful and they never reached the john marshall that they had talked to margaret's father david contacted a fellow friend who worked just outside of mount holly at the east hampton pd and along with him and some of their family friends they started a search around the bus stop area these searches yielded no results and later that night around midnight her father filed a missing persons report Police immediately dismissed the idea that Margaret could be a runaway after learning more about her and her family, and from there, they immediately suspected an abduction. And this is every parent's worst nightmare, and for the Fox family, it was coming true and was their new reality. Margaret had vanished without a trace. They were starting to suspect that it was related to this babysitting job and this John Marshall guy. Also, I just want to make a quick note that you could be thinking, how did her parents not know where she was going or why would they let her do this? But I'm sure that her parents were already experiencing so much shame and guilt that their daughter was gone and that they blamed themselves for it. So I don't want any negative comments saying that because even though they are deceased, I don't want to be disrespectful to her parents because they were probably thinking all the negative thoughts that you are about them. This was also the early 70s and I'm sure that a lot of people from the 70s would say the same thing that they babysat for strangers or went to strangers houses all the time and it was extremely common and also it is not anybody's fault except for the abductor police started to investigate and were trying to find out more about what happened and who this john marshall guy was and multiple witnesses said that they did see margaret get off the bus at her correct stop so we know that she did make it off the bus and wasn't forced to go to a different town Another witness says that they saw Margaret waiting on the corner of the street and that once a red car pulled up with a man driving it, Margaret approached the car and began talking to the man. From this point on, police have no witnesses or no idea of what happened. Did Margaret get in the car? Did this man force her into the car? Did something else happen entirely? It's completely unknown, but I'm sure that we can brainstorm and get some idea of what most likely happened. A few days later, police had their first suspect, assistant manager at the A&P supermarket, which was where the payphone that John Marshall had used was located. This employee was named John Marshall and supposedly Margaret was meeting a John Marshall. So this was a natural suspect because he had the same name. In hindsight, knowing that this crime was likely very very thought out and planned i doubt that the abductor would have used his real name the person who actually took margaret most likely used a fake name what i'm thinking is that the person who took margaret had talked to this john marshall at the supermarket multiple times and that's how he got the name because what is the chance that this guy uses a payphone and the guy right inside the store 
has the same name that he just gave Margaret. Maybe if the employee was questioned about any weird or creepy people that stood out, he could have given a few names and maybe that would have been helpful, but maybe not. I don't know. That was just where my mind went. The John Marshall that worked at the A&P supermarket was later cleared because he had an alibi and he passed a polygraph test. Another detail that was later found was that multiple women had come forward to the police saying that in Mount Holly, a man in a red Volkswagen had approached them and was trying to get them to come with him. The women thankfully refused, but this seemed like a pretty good lead because how many people can have a red Volkswagen in one town? Unfortunately, apparently quite a few because the man that had approached these women was later identified as a local sex offender, but he was cleared because he had an alibi as being on the radio with a listener because he worked as a ham radio operator. As we know, the first 48 hours of a child's disappearance are the most crucial and important hours. And as these hours painstakingly passed, FBI decided to get involved and help out with the case. What they were expecting now was for the abductor to reach out with a ransom demand, so the FBI started recording and monitoring all phone calls in the Fox home, and sure enough, four days after Margaret's disappearance, they got a call from a man demanding $10,000 for Margaret's return. $10,000 might be a lot of bread, but your daughter's life is the butter topic. Who is it? And the way that the caller voices it is so weird. I'm sure that when you guys listen to the audio, you'll find it weird too, but it was just like, your daughter's life is the buttered topping. Like who says that? A few days after that, the family received a letter reiterating what the call had said, but it also had the instructions to put the money in the box and also a reassurance that Margaret was all right, except for a torn blouse and broken glasses. That was it. No location to drop the money, no further instructions, and that would have been helpful. On June 30th, two days after the first letter had came, another letter came, but instead of saying your daughter's life is the buttered topping, it changed to past tense and said your daughter's life was the buttered topping. This made it seem to police like the abductor was saying, you screwed it up, it's too late, you didn't give me my money in time, it's over. Also, the letter was signed in a way to make investigators think that the Symbionese Liberation Army had something to do with the abduction. The SLA was a terrorist group who was active at this time and very well known for kidnappings and murders, but not in New Jersey. Investigators were never able to say if this letter pointing to this organization was real or a hoax. And they also never knew if the calls and letters were from the actual abductor or not. It was hard to tell because investigators had just made a local announcement with the event and details about Margaret's case the day before the call arrived. Now everyone knew about the abduction, so it wasn't like the caller was calling before the crime had even been released to the public. So this made the possibility of it being a hoax possible. Also, the recording of the phone call didn't get released until actually a few years ago in 2019, and it makes me wonder if they would have released the recording way back when the crime was happening, if someone would have come forward and said, hey, I recognize that voice, because it was so long ago that what if someone recognized it but is dead now? And I wonder why they waited so long to release it because it might have been helpful when the case was so popular. Anyways, the timing about it being announced to the public did not help the investigators determine whether the abductor was the real deal. But in the second letter, when the writer was assuring the family that Margaret was okay, and she wasn't badly hurt, he mentioned a detail about her broken glasses. But the detail about her glasses had never been announced to the public because she didn't wear her glasses all day every day, so it wasn't like a staple part of her daily look. 
It was something that she had brought along for that day, but didn't always wear. It wasn't something that they included in the original description of her. So either this was a very weird coincidence and guess, or the person sending the letters had taken Margaret and knew this detail because they had her. Also, in both the ransoms, no instructions were given on where to leave the $10,000. It seems to me like the abductor was never planning on returning Margaret even if she was alive and if she was dead that they were just tormenting the family. Throughout these months where the letters were arriving and new details were being revealed, Margaret's parents never lost the hope that she would be found, whether that was alive or dead, but just brought back to her family. They just wanted their daughter back. I mean, she was literally only 14 at this time. She had her whole life ahead of her and it was literally snatched right out from under her just because she was driven and wanted to get a job. Her father, David, never stopped searching around the towns and he was constantly spreading information about her and passing out flyers. And a reward was announced for anyone that had any information about Margaret or anything that would lead to find her. And false sightings of her were happening all around the world as far as the West Coast. But none of these panned out and they were all false sightings. In 1976, two years after the crimes, a man confessed to the abduction and murder of Margaret. But when police looked into it, they found out that he had an alibi of him being in the hospital at the time that the crime happened. And it just doesn't make sense to me still why these criminals confess to crimes that they didn't commit. Like, what is your guys' opinion of that? Because I still can't make sense of it. In 1988, a body that matched the description of Margaret was found. It was a young woman who was 5'1 to 5'2, 15 to 19 years old. But when investigators tried to compare and match it to Margaret, they had lost her dental records, which was the only thing that they had that they could use to identify her. Again, Another thing that I don't really understand is how this evidence is lost or these records are lost, but I guess stuff happens. Thankfully, years later, her brother was able to use his DNA to compare to the body and it was not a match. There is currently a reward of $25,000 for anything leading to new information or finding Margaret, but there has been no new advancements in the case since a few months after it happened, and Margaret has never been seen again since she stepped off that bus and supposedly talked to a man in a red car. She would be 62 years old right now if she was somehow still alive, and if she was a runway which I think is unlikely. She has never used her identity. She has never used her social security or opened a credit card, nothing. If she was abducted and murdered, which I think is the most likely case, who is this John Marshall guy? Clearly that wasn't his name, but had he done this before because it seems so well thought out and he got away with it. And additionally, where is Margaret? If he killed her, where did he put her body? or has he been holding on to it all this time? And that is all the information that we know about this terrible case. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and took away the fact that you should never go to a stranger's house or never meet with a stranger alone or even with someone else because you never know who these people truly are. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, all that YouTube stuff that you guys know how to do. And I will see you guys in my next video.